Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues from uh, Egypt, uh, Dr. Raham and uh, Dr. Ramin from Iran, who are here uh, on fellowships. Uh, Dr. Raham is here on a Fogarty Fellowship from Cairo University, and Dr. Ramin is here on an International AIDS uh, NIDA Fellowship from uh, Iran to study, uh, well, to develop a research project on amphetamine use in Iran. So uh, good to see you. Um, this is actually, what you're going to get today is, is an overview of my hobby. Um, as you heard, I have uh, an actual job here at UCLA. I'm a, I do research for the National Institutes on Health and have for the last uh, 40 years done uh, research and training in California throughout the United States. About 15 years ago, I was um, sitting in my office and the phone rang and uh, the person on the other end was a professor from Ben-Gurion University in Beersheba, uh, Israel. And he said, I was, I'm looking for Doug Anglin. Well, Doug Anglin's one of my colleagues who is ill. And so I said, well, Doug isn't in today. Uh, can I help you? And he said, well, I'm looking for a speaker to come to uh, Israel to give a talk on substance use. Do you know anybody? And I went, well, I kind of know something about the topic, so I, I, uh, I and that led into what you're now going to see. This was not designed by um, some grand plan. This is an opportunistic uh, set of activities which have uh, taken over most of my life. It's become more than a hobby, but uh, it wasn't intended that way. I mean, the way it, the way it happened, I went to, uh, to Beersheba where it had, the Oslo Accords had just been reached uh, in 1994. So there were a lot of activities in the region building cooperation between Israel and their neighbors. And so this one was the first meeting of the Palestinians and Israelis on uh, a topic that they could work, develop within their communities. It was the first time most of the Palestinians had been in uh, Israel and uh, there was a lot of tension. It was not exactly a, uh, a fun uh, meeting. But, it, but this, was sort of, uh, this was sort of a theme of what has, has led out of this. After I gave my one hour overview of substance use disorders and treatment, my colleague Richard Israelowitz said, you know, something we hadn't thought about was we really need a moderator for the rest of the two day meeting. And uh, we'd like to get somebody from the outside. Could you do it? And I, it was at that point where the thought bubble over my head went, Hold it, I'm just a drug abuse researcher. Now I'm like negotiating between the Israelis and Palestinians. <laughs> uh, but that's been the uh, sort of theme of what's happened. And, uh, but over the last 15 years, we've developed projects and we currently have active projects in these countries. And these have all really been one leading to another, leading to another. And I'll just, the, the presentation today will just give you an overview of kind of what some of the activities are and how we've been able to develop these projects and what we're currently doing. Now in the Middle East, as in the rest of the world, alcohol and tobacco are the two major, uh, well, let me just say, in, in the world, alcohol and tobacco are certainly the two psychoactive substances that create the greatest burden of health. In the Middle East, alcohol uh, unlike most of the world, alcohol creates a relatively small amount of uh, public health burden. Tobacco certainly does, and, and rates of cigarette smoking in uh, many parts of the Middle East are escalating, and we see a lot of American advertising in that part of the world. So tobacco is pretty much as we see throughout the rest of the world. Alcohol, because uh, these countries are predominantly Muslim, uh, there really is much less alcohol use than in the other parts of the world where we operate. Now our work, although it does touch on these, primarily focuses on illicit drug use. The work that I've done um, starting a lot of it for the United Nations, the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, really address illicit drug use predominantly. So that's a lot of what we've been working on. Um, these are some of the categories of uh, illicit drugs that we work on, opioids, are uh, the drug, the illicit drug that probably produces the greatest public health attention around the world because of the fact that most opioid use is uh, injected. And so we, it brings along with it the uh, risk of infectious diseases. 
Uh, if you talk to people at the World Health Organization about the whole issue of drug abuse, except for tobacco, um, they really probably would not deal with the issue of, of drug abuse, except for the fact that it drives the AIDS epidemic in some parts of the world. And there's one notable uh, country that I'll be talking about that hap happens to be in the Middle East. Amphetamine type stimulants are the most widely used illicit drugs other than cannabis. Um, and in this part of the world, we see a fair amount of uh, both amphetamine as well as a drug called Captagon, which is another form of amphetamine taken in tablets. Cocaine is, there's relatively uh, minimal use. Uh, we see it worldwide, uh, we see a fair amount of cocaine use, but not so much in the Middle East. And of course, the largest uh, category of illicit drug use is cannabis. And I guess I have to stop saying illicit because it, depending on the current public policy, it's a medicine or it's legal, so it's no longer an illicit drug. But these are the ones in the Middle East, specifically. We see uh, uh, 5 million opioid users. Uh, the majority of these uh, currently are probably in Iran. Uh, Dr. Ramin's work, and if, if we had time, he could talk to you about his work in Iran, where there's been a substantial opiate dependence problem for many years, uh, increasingly becoming a heroin problem increasingly becoming an injection drug use problem, which is, uh, has great significance for the uh, spread of HIV in that, in that country. Amphetamine type stimulants, um, tremendous rates of increase in the Gulf, in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, generally in the form of Captagon, which are these tablets manufactured in, in uh, Syria and uh, Pakistan that are trafficked throughout the area. All of these drugs, these different categories of drugs, are trafficked by very large, complex, sophisticated, uh, uh, multinational uh, uh, corporations, essentially, that uh, traffic in these drugs. For example, amphetamine is made using uh, pseudoephedrine, and so the availability of pseudoephedrine has a lot to do with the production of methamphetamine, but we see it in virtually all these countries. And of course, cannabis we see a lot. We have one project in southern Saudi Arabia where their major concern is cot use. Now cot use, cot is a stimulant, it's chewed, um, and for the most part people think of it as a relatively innocuous drug. However, in south Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, and in the Horn of Africa, we see a fair amount of cot use associated with psychosis, uh, with violence, with uh, a whole variety of uh, behavioral problems. So, these are the main illicit drugs in, in the region that we're, we're dealing with. HIV is predominantly in this region connected, uh, the connection is between illicit drug use and HIV in Iran. Uh, the rest of the countries in the region have relatively low levels. Um, there's a project that I, I think will be starting in Libya in um, the spring. Libya actually is one other country that has relatively high rates of HIV in uh, this region of the world. But uh, in areas like Lebanon and Iraq and Egypt, the, the rates are relatively low to the extent that we have good data on that. Uh, they seem relatively low. Now the region that we do work in is roughly uh, uh, overlaps with the World Health Organization uh, Middle East Regional Region, or they call it EMRO, the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office, that includes these countries. And um, this shows, this is one of their uh, figures, and it shows the um, areas where there's relatively high rates of injection drug use, um, where it's considered that there's moderate substance use, although I'm not sure how they made that estimate in, in Iraq, but because uh, there, are, there are no data from Iraq. Uh, that's one of the things we're in the process of doing. But let me, in, uh, in terms of the region and a number of physicians in the region, it's an area which has relatively low density of physicians, an even lower density of psychiatrists. Um, there, I think the number of uh, psychiatrists in Sudan, for example, is, uh, I think there are 30 psychiatrists in the country of Sudan. Most of them have moved to the Saudi Arabia where they have uh, fine work. Uh, but this is an area where uh, treatment services for uh, substance use disorders and psychiatric disorders in general are relatively uh, thin. 
Some countries like Egypt have well-developed psychiatric uh, training programs and medical schools, but uh, many of the countries in the region do not. This is the one slide I'll show you on uh, smoking prevalence. These are, um, uh, from, these are data from the World Health Organization in the region going from Oman, which has less than a smoking rate of less than 20% among males, to Djibouti, which is uh, upwards of 70%. You can see that there's a broad range of uh, rates of smoking, and in most of the countries it is increasing. Oman has a very low rate because they have a very active public health system where they address uh, tobacco use uh, very aggressively and they have very extensive prevention programs in, in uh, the schools and in the health system. But uh, you can see most of the rest of the countries are higher, well, well above what you see here in the U.S. in terms of male smoking rates. In terms of different drug categories in the region, uh, opioids, of course, Afghanistan is the world's largest producer of opium and uh, heroin. And the countries that have problems next door in Iran, there's a very severe heroin problem, Pakistan, Oman, and the others, as you see. Uh, stimulants have become a major problem in the Gulf region, although we're also seeing them in um, Iraq and Iran, and uh, cot is in the the southern part of Saudi Arabia and Yemen primarily. Age of starting drug use is decreasing in the area. Um, generally, this uh, drug use in this part of the world was generally uh, something that was started in the 20s. We now see it starting in the teens. And among street children in many of the, these parts of the world, we see a fair amount of cannabis use. Uh, in Egypt, it's called bango. It's a form of uh, cannabis that's uh, uh, widely used by uh, street children. They also, one thing I don't show in here is inhalants. Inhalant use is a particular problem among uh, uh, children in many of these uh, parts of the world, that gasoline and paint and other uh, solvents that are inhaled. Uh, injection drug use we think is increasing. Uh, we're seeing more use among women. Uh, there is the big concern, and the concern that funds much of the work that we're doing in this part of the world is concern about HIV. Um, and um, most of these users, well, it says they're not seeking treatment. In many cases, that's because there, there is no treatment. So uh, it's hard to know whether they would seek treatment if it did exist. Let me just run you through, now I'm going to give you a travelogue throughout these different countries that we're working in, just to give you an idea of what some of the, the work is that we're doing. Um, we started this work in Lebanon uh, about a decade ago, uh, working with uh, Ramzi Haddad and his staff at a treatment center called Schoon, which is a, uh, a treatment center in Beirut where they provide um, behavioral treatment and medication treatment using buprenorphine for the treatment of opiate dependence. They also do everything in this part of the region, in this, well, not every place, but in, in many of these countries I'll talk about. Substance use disorder services really are aimed at harm reduction, the reducing the harm produced by substance use, uh, as opposed to rehabilitation, where you're looking to help people stop using and become sober and stay off. Now, there's exceptions. Egypt has primarily a rehabilitation orientation. Iran, on the other hand, has a very strong harm reduction. But there's a continuum, and, and in general, most of the services tend to be more on the harm reduction end. Uh, Lebanon is a particularly good example of this. Um, this is the, the country of Lebanon. Now, Lebanon currently has one of their big challenges that they're currently working on that we worked on last May when I was there is Lebanon's a country of 4 million people. Right now, they currently have 1.5 million refugees from Syria that are um, in the country, and they still have 500,000 refugees from Palestine from uh, 1948. So they have a huge amount of people who are uh, not Lebanese citizens who are plunked into Lebanon that they take care of. Uh, in Among the Syrian refugees, they see a fair amount of uh, amphetamine use because there's a fair amount of amphetamine used in Syria. But the primary uh, drug problem in uh, Lebanon is our opiates. Has long been opiates. They've had connections to the uh, the trafficking areas out of Afghanistan. And so they've, they've been an area that's had 
relatively high rates of opiate dependence. These are some, they of course were historically a big producer of hashish. The Baca Valley is an area in, in eastern Lebanon, well, away from the ocean, away from the Mediterranean Sea, uh, where they uh, produce a lot of hashish. Uh, and it's always been very well known as being very high quality hashish in, in Lebanon. And that's viewed, it's not legal, but it's not, there are no sanctions for it. People use uh, hashish uh, in Lebanon relatively openly. Uh, Lebanon, of course, has had uh, its problems, as have many of these countries that I'll talk about, with uh, uh, violence. Uh, and they've had the war that went between uh, the mid-70s and 1990, uh, when there were the, the various factions in Lebanon were fighting over control of the country. There now is a uh, negotiated government that has representatives of both Muslim sects as well as the Christian sect that run the government. It's always tenuous, but they, they do seem to be moving along. They have um, a quite a, a, a forward-thinking public health policy in that they have, they're the one, one of the few countries other than Iran that's actually uh, approved the use of buprenorphine, which is a, an opiate treatment medication that is used for opiate substitution therapy and they combine that with HIV risk reduction, uh, education, and information. Uh, the reason we're there is that uh, a Swiss foundation, the Drosos Foundation, uh, funded a project that we're, we're currently doing. We've had some earlier projects there, but the one we're currently doing is evaluating this buprenorphine project, evaluating the extent of the use of buprenorphine, how it's being disseminated throughout the country, uh, what the treatment response is to the, for the patients on buprenorphine, uh, how it affects HIV risk behavior, and whether or not they're able to integrate uh, substance use disorder treatment with uh, HIV risk reduction activities. We're also looking, uh, well, since we were there doing this evaluation, the Drosos Foundation uh, asked us if we could evaluate a sexual health center. This is the first sec health center set up in Beirut to primarily provide services for the LGBT population. Um, uh, that's a very sensitive issue there. It, it's still uh, 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 being someone who is in the LGBT group is, is co still considered risky to reveal. So there are people who tend to not access the health services. So this clinic uh, called the Marsa Health Center was set up and they've immediately been inundated with uh, with requests for care, and so we're also evaluating what kind of services they're provided, what the HIV rate is among their clientele, and um, what other kinds of services are needed. So this is a project we'll be doing for three years. We go a couple of times a year. We've had one postdoctoral trainee come from Beirut, and we're establishing a relationship with uh, uh, Beirut Uni American University of Beirut, which is really a, a wonderful university that has uh, uh, is interested in developing a memo of understanding with UCLA for, for training in the future. So this is one we're working on. That's the, one of the mosques in uh, downtown Beirut. Beirut is a great city. It's a really uh, lovely city. This is uh, from the waterfront. It looks a lot like Santa Barbara, actually. Um, and this was in May, and you can see there's still snow on the, they, they, they ski. When we went, we went about two years ago, and we were doing a training with our Iraqi colleagues, and we were bringing them to Beirut to do training, and they took the weekend and went up to the mountains and went skiing. It was the first time they'd ever been in the snow. And uh, just in terms of uh, safety issues, probably the most risky thing I've ever done is going snowmobiling with the Iraqis. So uh, <laughs> the, that, was, that was the work we've done in, um, Israel, this is where we started actually in 1998, 1997. Um, MERC stands for Middle East Regional Cooperative. Um, this is a fund set up by the US State Department to fund scientific projects in the Middle East that will engage the Israelis with their neighbors in cooperative activities. Um, the first one we did uh, involved uh, doing drug assessments in Israeli and Palestinian communities where we uh, collected data, survey data from high school students on drug and alcohol use throughout um, 
six communities in Palestine and six communities in Israel, and then we met and discussed the data. Now, unfortunately, about two months after this first project began, the second intifada happened, and it's made it very difficult to do projects in the, bring this uh, Israelis and Palestinians together in the region, so we have to bring them here. We often have them here during the summer uh, for uh, project planning sessions. We used to go down to uh, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, but we can't go there anymore because of the conflict in Egypt. But this has been an interesting project, and this group started in, in 97, and Dr. Israelowitz and Dr. Afifi, and I'll talk about the Palestinian team in a minute, uh, are still in daily contact working on subsequent projects to the ones that we've started. They're, they're still working together. This is Israel, um, 6.5 million people. And from a, a substance abuse uh, point of view, one of the major uh, developments that occurred there was starting in the 90s, they started getting a very uh, high rate of immigration from the former Soviet Union. And they had, um, a, uh, they had a very high rate of uh, injecting drug users coming in with that immigration. Uh, that they think that uh, roughly doubled the number of injection drug users they have in Israel. The, uh, those those uh, people came in also had higher rates of HIV than were currently uh, seen in Israel. So they're, although the rates are still very low, they're still, uh, they're, they're very aggressive at with HIV uh, prevention and uh, uh, addiction treatment services. So I mentioned that uh, we started after the Oslo Accord and there were a lot of these people to people projects and we decided to use substance use disorders and work around that as a topic for these scientific uh, grants. And so we've had three of them now. Uh, since 1997, start with the, starting with the Bersheva workshop. And then we've done all sorts of training throughout Israel and Palestine. And um, we did a, uh, a large week-long training center, uh, training at the, uh, in the Arafat Health Center in Khan Yunus in Gaza back uh, in uh, the early 2000s. So there's been a lot of activity back and forth. There's been a fair amount of work between the Israelis and Palestinians, although they have to do it under... Uh, very quiet circumstances because they can't, particularly our Palestinian colleagues have to be very cautious about saying they're doing anything with the Israelis because that, that could be uh, dangerous for them. But they have actually maintained a very close working relationship. When I was in Cairo, I guess it was, I don't know, last spring, I was emailing both of them. I guess this was two years ago. I was emailing Richard and, and Mohammed they live about 30 miles from each other. Beersheba is in, is in the south of Israel, right next to the Gaza Strip, and Mohammed is in Gaza. So I was emailing them from Cairo, and this was during the incursion of the Israelis into uh, Gaza when they were bombing the, uh, uh, the uh, people in Gaza. There was, I guess there had been some rockets fired or something that was going on. But Mohammed was, you could, he was talking about the bombs going off and Israelowitz was talking about the helicopters leaving uh, uh, Beersheba. So one was like watching the helicopters leave and the other was actually on the receiving end. Uh, they both uh, have kids. Um, one of Mohammed's sons used to be, uh, used to work in Israel and was a day laborer and would cross the border into Israel. And Mohammed's uh, and Richard's daughter was the guard at the border gate in uh, uh, the Rafa gate that they would go through, or the Irez gate, I can't remember which one. But I mean, it's actually, it's all tied together and all mixed up. And as far as they're concerned, these are common problems they have. But the politics of the area make it complicated for them to work on these very common problems. So we did a lot of, these are just some other trainings we've done. We've done some other work for the the State Department uh, on uh, proposal development. The I mentioned the first uh, Merck project we did was on youth at-risk uh, at drug use. The second one was a project between the Israelis and the Egyptians where we um, uh, developed, a, translated a tool into Hebrew and Arabic, something called the Addiction Severity Index, which helps provide a standardized way of assessing people for substance use disorders. And, it's still being used in much of the region. And the third one that we're doing right now is um, 
One of my colleagues at, at UCLA has developed work with the children of um, women who have HIV. And she's developed a whole treatment program around that that we're going to see about translating into uh, Palestinian communities and Israeli communities. That's the third uh, Merck grant that we're working on. This is the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, Palestine, Mohammed Afifi, this is the, the other half of the Merck uh, group that we've worked with. This is the Gaza Strip. Um, the city of uh, Gaza City is in the north part. Khan Yunus, which is where we were doing our training, is right on the, near the Egyptian border on the south. And of course, this is all Israel. And on the, the western border is the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it's a very dense, one of the most densely populated places in the world. It has about uh, almost 4 million people in this little strip that's um, uh, 360 square kilometers. So it's a very tiny area, which is very densely populated. Um, and many of the people there, I guess over half, still live in, in refugee camps. These are people who were moved out of what is now Israel into uh, the Gaza Strip. Unemployment's a big problem. Uh, and the, it's, it's a relatively poor area. There is some substance use in the area. Um, when, when we did our survey there, it looks like uh, certainly cannabis is widely used. Prescription drugs were the main drugs because the, the pharmacy regulations are relatively lax. And so you can go into any pharmacy and get benzodiazepines or painkillers or a whole variety of, of uh, those kinds of medications. There's not a lot of heroin or drugs like cocaine, but there's a tremendous amount of uh, use, particularly among women. The rates among women are higher than among men because it's prescription drug use. It's not Ill illicit drug and a lot of benzo use. And I'm sure if I lived there, I would be regularly taking benzos myself. Uh, or, um, but as I said, we've been doing these Merck-related projects, uh, data collection and training. All of the work that we've done, wherever it is we've gone, we do lots of training around the work that we're doing. So we do work for community groups, uh, for the um, schools, for the universities. Uh, we give lots of grand rounds at places that we go. So we've done a lot of uh, training in both uh, the Gaza Strip as well as in the West Bank. Uh, those are just things that tend to come out of the, the, the visits there when we take UCLA faculty there. This is what we found in the, um, the survey in the, in the high schools and the universities. Tobacco use, um, relatively low, although increasing. Alcohol use, uh, very low, heroin and, and the rest. But uh, because in Gaza, it's pretty hard to get illicit drugs into it. It's a very, it's a box. It's a box with a fence around it. So it's uh, challenging to bring in illicit drugs. I think that's part of the reason why Prescription drugs are the main drugs that we see used there. Similar situation in Iraq. When Saddam was in power, the borders were so well controlled and the penalties were so severe, there was very little illicit drug use. There's now starting to be a lot more illicit drug use. But what drug use did exist or does exist was primarily prescription medications that people would get from the pharmacies. This is Dr. Afifi and his team of uh, surveyors. And we've, we've had all of those folks come to Egypt. Uh, when we go to Egypt and do work there, we often are able to bring them over for training because they're also attempting to set up treatment services in the Gaza Strip. And they have absolutely no treatment uh, there at all. And so they've been coming to our trainings in Egypt to uh, become uh, familiar with uh, treatment approaches. And this is my colleagues uh, one day going into the Gaza Strip. Uh, the, the majority of work, the largest amount of work we do now is with uh, Egypt. And we, uh, about a year ago, were awarded a NIH Fogarty uh, D43 training program where we train Egyptian fellows here at UCLA. They come for a period of, well, it's varying periods, but up to a year for uh, training and work on developing research protocols, which they will, Dr. Raham is our first fellow. She will be going back to Egypt and developing a research program. And then we're going to pester her to get a NIDA grant to continue the work through uh, NIH funding uh, after she finishes her uh, dissertation work. 
But uh, we've, uh, of course, then when I was going, started to go to the region, Cairo was always the place you could go, and it was the one place of sanity in the, in the area of, di but that changed uh, a couple of years ago. So Cairo is also now has its challenges. Um, but Egypt is the most populous uh, country in the region. It's, uh, the population is very dense. Uh, Cairo is a city that is, uh, was designed, I guess, for two or three million people, and it now has close to 20 million people, so it's packed, it's, uh, it's uh, very dense. Uh, in tracking its substance use problems over the years, when I first was going there in the late 90s, um, cannabis was the main problem. We, there, that was the main thing that was seen. Very little alcohol, very little cocaine, some heroin, not a lot, but uh, there were little pockets of heroin users that were kind of pointed to as these are our addicts that we have over here. Um, that's, uh, that's changed. And I'll, well, these are the activities that we're doing. We've done a big counselor training program. We had a big project for the United Nations called TreatNet where we uh, set up training centers around the world. And Cairo was our training hub for the TreatNet project. <laughs> Um, we used Cairo as the center for training our, an Iraqi health team that came to Cairo on a number of occasions, uh, physicians, nurses, psychologists, where we, they were trained by Raham's colleagues at Cairo University because we wanted to do the training in Arabic and in, in, a, in a, a culture where they could see the treatment being delivered within a, a Muslim culture. Um, we've, we ha have ha now had three of our... Uh, Cairo University folks visit. Um, uh, four of us will be going to February, going to Cairo in February for their annual psychiatric meeting, and we'll be having we're setting up podcasts of our uh, core addiction training material that will become part of the curriculum at Cairo University Medical School. We have a memo of understanding between UCLA and Cairo University, and it's this is a, a long-term relationship that we've developed with some very good friendships on, uh, with uh, lots of people there. The thing that's happened that's been interesting from a substance use point of view is the drug tramadol has become widespread through, uh, in the last three to, three to five years. Now, I'm not sure it's necessarily related to the Arab Spring phenomenon in uh, Egypt, but it has, or the timing has been somewhat overlapping. Tramadol is an opiate painkiller. It's available here in the U.S. called Ultram. Um, very little use of it, abuse of it here in the United States because we have drugs like Vicodin and Oxycontin that are much more potent. However, in, in Egypt, the uh, tramadol is the main painkiller used outside hospitals. So it is uh, available because the pharmacies, again, are very lax. People can get tramadol. It started coming out of the pharmacies, and then it started coming in from... Uh, illicit manufacturers, and it's very available now. Uh, we're just publishing a paper on tramadol. It has some particularly problematic um, uh, attributes when used in high doses. It produces seizures to people who use it both at high dose and as people withdraw from it, they see seizures. So it's uh, this, and it's brand new. I mean, it, and the, the the problem with it is brand new in the last three years or so. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Raham will be studying is how people get onto this drug, how they, what's their pathway of, of beginning it, and hopefully our NIDA grant will be to follow them over time to see what happens to them. Here in the U.S., with prescription opiate users, one of the big things we're seeing, many of them switching to heroin. Many of the people who started off taking drugs like Vicodin and Oxycontin codeine uh, are now switching to heroin as prescription drugs become harder to get, relatively harder to get, and uh, heroin prices are, uh, are reduced. So we're wondering if that also will happen in Cairo because that would have sig very significant public health concerns because once people start using heroin, generally they start injecting it. Uh, the tramadol use is primarily taken in tablets, and so the HIV and other infectious disease risks are still relatively low. But if you start seeing a fair amount of injection drug use, you'll start to see uh, increased levels of uh, HIV. Uh, obviously, a tourist picture from Cairo. This is Tahir Square from uh, 
I believe this is from the Intercontinental Hotel, which is where we usually stay. Uh, but this was during the, the demonstrations. Uh, the UAE, one of our colleagues from Egypt, Dr. Tarek Gawad, has moved to Abu Dhabi where he's the director of their national center. Now this is a very different environment. Uh, this, they have unlimited money. And so they're building a treatment center with, uh, they have more psychiatrists per square inch than any place that I've ever been. Uh, and nurses and psychologists. And, um, and they're actually uh, have developed a treatment center that's really quite uh, remarkable. Um, our role has been to help train their uh, staff, both their psychiatrists as well as their um, psychologists. We've had teams of them coming here for training. And we've been involved in helping them set up a data system. They have a fully electronic data system like, like the UCLA Medical Center that's quite sophisticated. But they're not entirely sure what to do with the data. So we're helping them uh, use the data to evaluate their, tr their treatment efforts, to uh, improve them, to uh, uh, better target the use of medications to different patients, and, and uh, also to treat their co-occurring psychiatric and medical disorders. This is the mosque across the river from the National Rehabilitation Center. It's a gigantic mosque. Um, that work led us to meeting some Saudis who were the Saudi Arabia has a, a well-established addiction system. It's limited, but it's uh, four government hospitals run in the major cities, Jeddah, Riyadh, Dammam, and uh, Ghassim, which are throughout the, the country of uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, they're very well-trained staff, very um, uh, um, good quality treatment services, except that they don't use any medications uh, to speak of. Uh, they're, they're a non-medication oriented um, kind of treatment. So they do lots of um, behavioral treatments, which we've done a lot of training with them on behavioral treatments. But we've continued to sort of nudge for the idea that they really need to bring in medications to effectively treat their uh, injection drug users, because the data are really clear. Injection opiate users. Injection opiate use is a chronic relapsing disorder and you really to get effective treatment you need to have medications like methadone and buprenorphine. And so we're just getting ready to start a buprenorphine large clinical trial, free site clinical trial in Saudi Arabia. The um, Saudi is a, a big country, 28 million people. Uh, the rates of substance use are mostly hidden. Uh, they don't really have any national statistics on substance use disorders. But these treatment centers, the one in Riyadh is probably 100 beds of residential treatment as well as a large outpatient program of counseling. Uh, so they, they see uh, a large number of people who present for treatment, uh, about 95% male. And one of the reasons for this medication uh, introduction is that the, uh, one of the female psychiatrists has been uh, is good friends with a director of the National Institute of, of Drug Abuse, Nora Volkoff, and they've uh, made this a priority and we, we're making reasonable efforts on this. The other thing we're doing is to, um, about eight years ago, the king went to the southern part of Saudi Arabia to a city called Jazan, which is right on the border of Yemen. It actually used to be part of Yemen uh, until the Saudis took it away from them in the 70s. Uh, but the king apparently was so stunned at how, how severe the poverty was. And it's very rural and it's very underdeveloped. Um, I'd been to Saudi Arabia three or four times and been to Riyadh and Dammam and Jeddah. And the first time I went, to, I thought they were all, all of Saudi Arabia was like those cities. But when you went, go to Jazan, it's a, uh, the airport is a one gate airport. And, um, the roads, most of the roads are not paved. It's a very rural area. And so the, the king decided he was going to build a university there. So they're building a university. And they, he's invested $10 billion to build the, this university right out in the middle of nowhere. It's actually a kind of a gorgeous spot because it's right on the Red Sea, but it's, uh, there's nothing there to, uh, but we're, so of course we're helping them. Uh, 
not build a university, but they also want to establish their national addictions uh, research center there. Part of the mandate of this new university is to uh, develop uh, what they call the Substance Use Research Center. They've now funded it with uh, $25 million a year. They're uh, awarding grants to Saudi scientists uh, to develop behavioral and medication research on addiction. And we're helping them with developing the grant review process and the whole scientific infrastructure to evaluate uh, grants. Um, and their major drug problem locally is cot use. And so they'll probably have the world's expertise in the area of cot dependence. This is the. Uh, as you can tell, this is the, the, it's, the university is being built right in the middle of the desert, um, which, which they have a lot of in Saudi Arabia. Uh, now, in Iraq, uh, we've been involved in Iraq for four years now. Um, the um, U.S. government, the State Department, has funded um, both some treatment development activities, which is the team that we brought to Beirut and to Cairo, and we brought to the U.S., uh, psychiatrists, physici uh, other physicians, nurses, psychologists, and so there's been, we've done a lot of training with this group uh, from Baghdad Medical University, which has a, now has a memo of understanding with UCLA. Um, they're also, uh, we're now setting up to do a um, community epidemiology work group, which is to help them develop an understanding of the extent of the drug use in Iraq. Uh, my colleague Al and I will be going there in January to do training with surveyors to, to go out throughout Iraq to collect data in a household survey. Um, this is funded by the State Department and the survey should take a year and we should have the results by early uh, 2015. We, uh, we did a meeting in Baghdad in May and we already know vaguely what we're going to find uh, but we don't know how the extent of it. We also don't know uh, exactly uh, how it sets up geographically. This is, uh, this is about 25% of our Iraqi team when they were in Cairo. They're standing in front of Cairo University uh, Department of Psychiatry. Uh, these are Al and I when we travel to Iraq. These are our friends, Muhammad and Ali, who travel with us. Uh, and this is the view from the hotel where I stayed. It's the Sheridan Ishtar, and it has a mosque right across. So that sunrise I get I get the morning prayers in a fairly high decibel but this is the pedestal that had the, the Saddam statue that was torn down which I thought was a sort of nice historic spot to visit uh, and this is the uh, we went to uh, uh, Karbala Karbala which is where one of the uh, main Shia shrines is that is uh, quite a remarkable place Finally, um, we're not really doing projects in Iran, but uh, Dr. Ramin is uh, our second fellow from Iran, and we're talking about uh, future fellows and training programs, and he's doing his own research project. Um, there, Iran has by far the most well-developed addiction system in the whole uh, region, uh, and part of the reason for that is because they have a substantial heroin problem, and they have had for uh, quite a few years. Uh, they've, been, they've developed an extensive program of methadone treatment and buprenorphine treatment. Uh, they're very aggressive and forward thinking in how they uh, have implemented this treatment. Uh, it's together with HIV uh, treatment services, and they've made a, a, a very great um, dent in slowing the spread of HIV with this very aggressive public health policy. And uh, he runs clinics that uh, provide treatment uh, as part of this effort. But it's uh, historically, uh, smoking opium was the primary way of ingesting drugs. But increasingly, they're seeing now about a quarter of the Iranians are using uh, injection drug use, which is, of course, where the HIV risk comes. And I'll go through this. Uh, so injection drug use is a problem. I just wanted to mention the last thing was this, uh, this was a meeting that we did in the region where we brought people from 24 countries to Istanbul to talk about treatment systems across the region because part of our interest is in helping the, the countries in this region that haven't, for the most part, had addiction treatment systems, developed systems. And we had this meeting in Istanbul that uh, 
had all of these representatives. This one was funded by the Institute for Peace because we, we had it funded as, a, as something to develop cooperation across the region. And we had people from all the countries, including Israel, uh, participating in this. So, and it was co-funded by WHO and the UN and uh, the National Institutes of Health. So we put together sort of a whole pile of money and, uh, and created this, uh, this group. And these are the kinds of efforts that we've been interested in. So it's a lot of kind of pieces of projects from different places, but it's, uh, it's actually developed into quite a nice hobby. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>